All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. We're continuing our study in the major prophets. We've already gone through Isaiah. We've gone through Jeremiah. We've gone through Lamentations, which was written by what we believe Jeremiah. And now we're in a new prophet. Uh, Kevin, uh, you know, yesterday I described, <laughs> I described Ezekiel as a humdinger. I don't know how else to describe this. That's not our one word for the Messiah, but it could be, you know, for all we know. Here we are in Ezekiel. It was titled, the book was titled for Ezekiel. Now, if you're new to Revive School or you're just listening in, we're going to spend a lot of time today building up the background, the historical backdrop, the, the author, the timeline, the time frame, because the reality is if you don't have this, your head is spinning. I thought Isaiah was a lot, you know, and it was current, first coming, second coming, millennium, tribulation. I thought Jeremiah was a lot, you know, hey, we're going into captivity, you know, and then I thought Lamentations wasn't so much because all of a sudden it was just lamenting, lamenting, lamenting. But Ezekiel, just can you go to the Kings and Prophets? Ezekiel is in this time frame. We're going to get into it. I just want to have a visual here, okay? So remember this, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, they're all right here, you guys. Okay, and they're all talking about, yes, Babylonian captivity, but Ezekiel gets into a whole lot more than that. Okay, so this is where he gets really fun and interesting. The name Ezekiel, okay, it means a couple things. Okay, it means strengthened by God. Okay, that sounds good because as he's going through this period, he needs to be strengthened by God. But it also can mean to seize or to hold fast with God. So in other words, many people would say it means uh, a man who God had seized. Now, what's so fun about this is, is you're going to need strength from the Lord to what? To function in a prophetic ministry, which he's been called to. So if you go to Ezekiel 3, 8 through 9, you're going to begin to see Ezekiel 3, 8 and 9, what he's been called to. It says, look, I've made your face as hard as their faces and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Verse 9 I've made your forehead like a diamond, harder than flint. Don't be afraid of them or discouraged by the look on their faces, even though they are a rebellious house. Kevin, this is his target audience. Sounds like Isaiah and sounds like Jeremiah, doesn't it? A little bit even worse. He's going to use visions. He's going to use prophecies. MacArthur says he uses parables, signs, and symbols to proclaim and dramatize, this is interesting, the message of God to his exiled people. Okay, so this is who Ezekiel is communicating to. You know, you're kind of like, gosh, this, this doesn't sound like a fun calling. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. Uh, it's a little too personal. All right, so here's a vision. J, J. Vernon McGee, I, I actually, I love this quote. J. Vernon McGee says, what you see from Ezekiel is not a vision of the person of God. So when we begin, in, when we begin to get into the vision, okay, in Ezekiel 1. It's not a person of God that he is not seen here. It's a vision of the presence of God. I want you to understand something. I'm going to come back to this quote later on, but really to me, that quote describes Ezekiel and his relationship with God. It's He's always constantly in the presence of the Lord. Does that make sense? It's just kind of like that's how he can communicate to hard, thick-headed, stubborn, rebellious people. So, all right, if you go to Ezekiel 1.1, uh, when, when was this written? Let's learn a little bit more about Ezekiel himself. Okay, it says in the 30th year, in the fourth month on the fifth day of the month. Most people would say, uh, again, we cannot prove this, okay? But this, would, which would be a great theory, is that if 30 years old refers to his age, which is a really good chance that this is talking about the 30th year of Ezekiel, it means then that five years ago, okay, Think about it this way. He was 25 years old when he was taken captive. Kevin, taken captive to? Babylon. Babylon. And it was 30 years old when he was called into the ministry. So in Ezekiel 1, you begin to hear about his calling into the ministry. But five years prior to this, he was taken into captivity. So we are in the fifth year, obvious statement, kept it obvious, fifth year of captivity. Does that make sense? And in the fifth year of captivity, he receives a call on his life. Now, if you think about it, the age 30 was when the priests began their office. So it's actually a legit thought, a legit point that this could be the notable year for Ezekiel when he began his ministry. So some people would say he began his ministry in 593, 592. Okay. And then it extended over a period of time for at least, uh, if you go to Ezekiel 29, verse 17, 
Ezekiel 29, verse 17. Kevin, this is going to be fun. You're going to be all over the place here. In the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came. So many people would say, you know, his ministry at least lasted 22 to 27 years. Okay? Just a thought. Okay? Uh, he was, what, Ezekiel was what most people considered a contemporary, remember, of Jeremiah. Okay? So they're kind of going along in this, uh, in this area. Now, uh, Jeremiah would have been 20 years older. Okay, I think this is an interesting thought. And then think about it this way. Daniel would have been the same age. Again, all thoughts depending on the dates that you have. But the point is, is that they're working uh, in the same time frame. Okay, Ezekiel though, this is really interesting. We've already determined if you go to verse 3, Ezekiel 1 verse 3, okay, we know that he was clearly a priest. The word of the Lord came directly to Ezekiel the priest. Most of us, let's just face it, I, for myself personally, when I think of Ezekiel, I don't think of him as a priest. I think of him as a prophet. So here you have Ezekiel known as a priest and a prophet. And so because of, Jerem uh, because of Ezekiel being a priest, what you'll see is in Ezekiel 8 and Ezekiel 40, you'll see a lot of language about the temple. So there's an insight there, just a little bit of his backdrop of Ezekiel being a priest. But Kevin, here's what's interesting. Well, yeah, he might be a priest. Yeah, he might be writing about a temple, but it's not like he's hanging out in the temple, except in his visions, which is really bizarre. You know, here he is describing the temple because the Lord just clearly showed him a vision, but not because he was in it. Now, he could have been earlier on in the age, but I think you get the point. God clearly gave this to him as a vision. Uh, Ezekiel did have a wife in Ezekiel 24. Uh, and in fact, Ezekiel was among, hear this out, he was among the 10,000 Jews. So it was Ezekiel, his wife, 10,000 Jews. They were taken captive to Babylon in 597 BC, which you find in 2 Kings 24. And they lived in, Kevin, if you go there, Ezekiel 3, verse 15. Okay, this is where they lived. Ezekiel, his wife, and the 10,000 folks, they lived in Tel Abib. I came to the exiles at Tel Abib who are living by the Chabar Canal. canal excuse me. So here you, have, uh, here you have the Chabar Canal, okay? This is where the Jewish settlement, this would be the 10,000 exiles, okay? This is the 10,000 folks that are living there, okay? Here's obviously Babylon. So this is going to kind of be their, their home base. Now his wife does die in the exile. In Ezekiel 24, 18, his wife passes away, okay? So we know that his wife came in exile and that she died. Ezekiel's there. He's a priest. He's a prophet. He's amongst 10,000 uh, other exiles. When did Ezekiel die? Maybe, the rabbi tradition says, maybe uh, an Israelite uh, prince actually who um, functioned in idolatry, uh, maybe because Ezekiel called him out. The, rabbi, uh, the tradition says that in 560 BC he was killed because he called out the idolatry in a prince. Okay, again, just a thought. Now, where did he receive his call? Well, he received his call in 1 2. Ezekiel 1 2. He was to prophesy, right? Ezekiel 1 2 on the fifth day of the month. It was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile. So you have to add this to this list. King Jehoiakim, okay, here you have here, King Jehoiakim right here, right? Remember, uh, you have Jehoaz, Josiah, Jehoazai, Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. Jehoiakim is taking into exile with the 10,000 folks, right? With the 10,000 folks. Uh, Kevin, you want to allude to that? Go ahead. He got his eyes poked out. He got his eyes poked out, right? And now 10,000 folks, Ezekiel's there. His wife is there. This is all who's coming there, okay? And it's during the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Okay, everybody on the same page here. And Kevin, poke, his eyes are poked out in the process. Now, Ezekiel, there's, a, there's just a lot. Okay, Ezekiel dates his prophecies from 597 BC. Okay, and there's multiple languages. Okay, like if you go to Ezekiel 8.1. Okay, constantly throughout this text, you're going to see dates. Okay, Ezekiel 8.1 in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month. That actually is language of how theologians would put all these dates together. If you go to Ezekiel 20 verse 1, I'm not going to do this in all of them, but I want you to see the importance of this. Ezekiel, in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month. Okay, once you begin to get a timeline down, you will begin to see the process of how this all unfolds. Uh, one of the very last dates you'll see, in which you've already alluded to this, is Ezekiel 29, verse 17. Uh, Ezekiel 29, 17, you'll see the same language here. In the 27th year, 
in the first month, on the first day of the month. Many people would say uh, this is the last date of 571 to 570 BC. Okay, so there's your language. Now, here's where it's interesting. In Ezekiel 1 through 28, I'm talking about chapters here, you will see MacArthur says it's going to be in chronological order. So Kevin, you and I can be rest assured as we're reading it. Okay, this makes sense. Now in Ezekiel 29, really just Ezekiel 29, one and on, you're gonna see a, the prophet, here's what he does. He regresses, okay, he goes back a year earlier, a year earlier than 26, one. Okay, so just in chapter 29, does he go back, okay, to right before uh, Ezekiel 26? Okay, hang on here. But then when you get into Ezekiel 31 and on, what does it have? It's pretty close to chronological order. Don't you love that? It's close to chronological order. So basically chapter 29, er, and then 30, here we go again, okay? Again, this is just kind of a backdrop. Now, you have to understand something on this picture, okay? Remember, David and Solomon, I'm gonna go way back for a second, okay, to understand the big picture. David and Solomon, they had one kingdom, right? It wasn't until 2 Kings, really, when you begin to experience the split of the kingdom, okay? So the United Kingdom lasted 110 years, okay? Then in the process, the divided kingdom took place from 931 to 722. Okay, so 931 to 722, you had the split, Israel Northern and Judah Southern. Okay, so from 931 to 722. Israel fell to Assyria, okay, roughly in 722. And then here you have Judah, the surviving kingdom for 135 years, okay? They're on their own roughly for 135 years. And then Kevin, everybody ends up in the Babylonian captivity. Okay, that's kind of a, a, a big picture. Now, in this, the Assyrian military, okay, I'm reading some of my historical notes here, okay, what they did is they crumbled, okay, after 626 BC. Hang in here. Egypt attempted to conquer this. You guys remember this? And then what did the Babylonians do? The Babylonians come in and they smash the Assyrians, okay? They smash the Assyrians, and then what do they do? The Battle of, uh, is it Carchemish? Did I say that right? Yeah, Battle of Carchemish, right? That was kind of, we talked about this a couple days ago. The Battle of Carchemish, there was a big victory for the Babylonians. Why is this important? Because that's how we've gotten to this point today. You have to have this big progression. So you had the kingdom, the split kingdom, the Assyrians come in, the Egyptians are there, the Babylonians come in, and then they take over. Now, as far as um, when Ezekiel heads into his environment, Couple things, okay? Domestically, I really like what John MacArthur did. He says, all right, what happens is when they're coming into captivity, they function more as colonists than captives, okay? In other words, they are allowed to have farm tracts of land under somewhat favorable, uh, favorable conditions. And think about this. Can you go to Ezekiel 3.24? Ezekiel 3.24 describes Ezekiel even in captivity, you guys. In Ezekiel 3.24, it says he had his own house. Spirit entered me and set me on my feet. He spoke of me. He said, go shut yourself inside your house. So it's a really crazy picture of, yes, he's in captivity, but he even has a home. So I want to paint a picture. Yes, it's tough, but yet at the same time, God clearly had provided for them as well. Now in this, what you're going to see this language of is that there will be false prophets deceiving the exiles. And remember, we talked about this in Jeremiah of saying, hey guys, we're not going to be here that long. Do you remember this? There's this language of false prophets saying, hey, you're going to get out, you're going to get out, you're going to get out. But yet what happens is Ezekiel warns from 593 to even into 585 BC, Ezekiel is warning those that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed and the exile was going to be prolonged. So Ezekiel, just like Jeremiah, is fighting the false prophets, saying, hey, it's going to be short-lived, short-lived, get ready. No, he says, no, guys, you need to make this your home. You need to make this your environment. Now, in Jere uh, Ezekiel 33, 21, I know, you guys, this is like a fire hose. Hang in here, okay? I haven't even got to the text yet. Okay, in Ezekiel 33, 21, say, it says this, in the 12th year of our exile... In the 10th month, on the fifth day of the month, a fugitive from Jerusalem came to me and reported, the city has been taken. So, Kevin, they, here they are in exile in the 12th year. Somebody escapes Jerusalem and says, hey, by the way, six months later after it's already happened, 
Did you know that Jerusalem's been taken? So what is Jer uh, Ezekiel prophesying? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And when it happened, they didn't even know until six months later. And so here you have basically an escapee coming to Ezekiel saying, hey, guys, by the way, it's not going to good. So when you hear that the city has been taken and you're in exile, what happens is all of a sudden everybody has lost hope. And so you're going to hear this reminder of, but don't worry, Israel still has a future. That's why we're going to get into the Valley of Dry Bones. It doesn't look good, but guess what? God can still restore our people and our, our land. First 24 chapters, MacArthur says you're going to see the prophecies of the ruin of Jerusalem. So first 24 chapters, all he does is talk about destruction on Jerusalem. It's not going to be pretty. And then he says in 25 through 32, I know we've already kind of broken this up, but he says there's prophecies of retribution on the, on the nations. And then when you get into 33, which is a transition, you're going to get instructions concerning the last call for Israel to repent. And then 34 through 48, you begin to hear about God's future restoration of Israel. All right, big picture. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, they all flow together. They all fit together. And there's a call on Ezekiel's life. I need you to, to release the word regardless of how hard it is. And that's exactly what he does. In Ezekiel 1, verse 1, in the 30th year, in the fourth month, uh, on the fifth day of the year, while I was among the exiles, so he's there, fifth year into this, correct? Uh, of the exiles by the Chabar Canal, the heavens opened and I saw visions of God. It's crazy if you think about, uh, here he is at the Chabar, Chabar Canal, and here he's seeing visions. Kevin, can you go to Psalm 137, verse 1? We actually use Psalm 137, uh, as a reference for our team when we are looking back on things. Now look, here you have those that are in exile. Here you have the Israelites. At the same time, they're at the rivers of Babylon, at the Chabar Canal. Look what it says, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered uh, Zion. So here you have the exile folks crying and weeping about what they're missing. And then what do you have Ezekiel doing? He's getting downloads of visions from the Lord. Talk about a, a contrast of visions and weeping. Same time frame. And it says in verse 2, On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile, the word of the Lord said, Hey, I need you to get ready. He's preparing Ezekiel for his call in his life. And the word of the Lord came directly to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, Buzi, Buzi in the land of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, by the Chabar Canal. And the Lord's hand was on him there. Now, look, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to give you images because if you don't have these images, it becomes overwhelming. And when you look at these images, you can really get distraught on like the details. I don't want you to get caught up in all the details of the images. I want you to have the picture of how God showed himself. OK, so in verse four, J. Vernon McGee says, look, what you begin to see okay, is flashing light. Okay. He says, I looked and there was a whirlwind coming from the north, a great cloud with a flashing back and forth and brilliant light all around. In the center of the fire, there was a gleam like amber. Scripture says the form of our, uh, well, let me just say this. Okay, verse four. Okay, Kevin, there's this flashing light. Can you go to verse 13 and verse 14? I'm going to try to do this in a quicker summary here. It says, the form of the living creatures was like the appearance of burning coals of fire and torches. Fire was moving back and forth among, between the living creatures. It was bright with lightning coming out of it. The creatures were darting back and forth like flashes of lightning. So what does Ezekiel see? He sees flashing light coming back and forth. Like this is part of not the person of God, Kevin, but the presence of God. Remember to go back to Vernon McGee's quote. He's seeing a vision of the presence of God. And one of the ways that God shows up is through the flashing light. He then says in, uh, in verse 5, and it's really in verses 5 through 12 and 15 through 25, what does he see? He sees the vision of cherubim. Okay, so we got flashing light and cherubim. It says the form of four living creatures came from it. And this was their appearance. They had human form. But each of them had four faces and four wings. So you got four creatures, okay? And on these four creatures, Kevin, we have four faces and they have four wings, okay? This is kind of an interesting picture. Now, look at this. Their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the hooves of a calf, sparkling like gleams of polished bronze. They had human hands under their wings on their four sides. 
All four of them had faces and wings. Their wings were touching. The creature did not turn as they moved. In other words, uh, it, you didn't even have to take time to turn. I love this image. It was just like, there's a cool picture. They were able to move in any direction without needing to turn first. In other words, MacArthur says they were given swift access to do God's will at any time. Four individuals, four faces, four wings, legs were straight, soles of their feet like hooves. They had wings that were touching, their wings were touching. They moved at the instant of like, as God spoke to them. Okay, this is a big picture here. Then it says this in verse 10, I'm gonna jump in here with another picture here, okay? Even though we haven't finished up with the description, then you'll realize that there is an intelligent purpose behind this, okay? It says, and that comes from verse 10, the form of each of their faces was that of a man. And each of the four had the face of a lion on the right, the face of an ox on the left, and the face of an eagle. <laughs> we could literally teach an entire week, literally right here, Kevin, if you go back to verse 10, on this description. Okay, the, I have to just do this. this. This blew my mind. I can't tell you if I agree with this or not, but I really liked it. Okay, just hang in here for a second, okay? First of all, Matthew, okay, I say Matthew here in a second. Uh, one of the descriptions is, a, is the face of a lion, right? Well, some would say that's a picture of the king, which comes from the gospel of Matthew. Some would say then here you have an ox, which is a picture of a servant, which comes from the gospel of Mark. Okay, some would say then look at this. It says he had uh, the face of a man, which would then be humanity. Right, which then we know falls into Luke. And then here you guys have, you have an eagle, which would then form and paint a picture of his deity, which then you have John. This is what he sees, and these are their faces. He says in verse 11, he says, this is what their faces were like. Their wings were spread upward. Each had two wings touching that of another and two wings covering his body. Each creature went straight ahead. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went without turning as they moved. Verse 13 and 14, we already described this as these flashing lights. The form of the living creatures was like the appearance of burning coals of fire and torches. Fire was moving back and forth between the living creatures. It was bright with lightning coming out of it. And then it continues on. When I looked at the living creatures, there was, and here we go, uh, verses 15 through 26, you also begin to see pictures of, yes, Kevin, I wrote this, wheels. Wheels. There was one wheel on the ground beside each creature. How many creatures are there? Four. Four creatures and each creature has a, a wheel and each creature had four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their craftsmanship was like the gleam of Beryl, Beryl and all four had the same form. Their appearance and craftsmanship was like a wheel within a wheel. Okay. Now in verse 17, just so you know, this is endless teaching right here on every one of these points. I'm fully aware of that. I want to point out verse 17. When they moved, they went in any of the four directions without pivoting as they moved. What most theologians would say is the purpose of the wheels, hear this out, okay? Because remember, he's sitting at the, 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 the Chiber Canal, okay? He's on the river. He's hanging out with the exiles. They're weeping, they're crying, and he's getting visions. Many would say that these wheels are a form of, and don't laugh at this because I did it first, <laughs> a judgment machine. It's almost like God is truly making with the wheels within a wheels. It's almost like he's made a machine and these cherubim are going to actually uh, execute and form and, and release God's judgment. And these wheels are what actually allow them to move. So in 18, their, rim, their rims were large and frightening. Each of their four rims were full of eyes all around, which is just an interesting picture, you guys, uh, of God's omnipresence. Like God can see everything. And it might even be through these guys. When I say guys, I don't mean that lightly. <laughs> so when the living creature moved, the wheels moved beside them. When the creatures rose from the earth, the wheels also arose. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, the creatures went. In the direction the spirit was moving. The wheels rose alongside them. Remember, four creatures, four living creatures. We're gonna get into this later on this week. Here they have four faces. They've got wheels with them and they're moving as the spirit guides them. Okay, the wheels rose alongside them for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. It was almost like they were connected. Okay, verse 21, when the creatures moved, the wheels moved. 
When the creatures stood still, the wheels stood still. When the creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose along them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Verse 22. The shape of an expanse with a gleam like an awe-inspiring crystal was spread out over the heads of the living creatures. Okay, there's a large platform. And under the expanse, their wings extended one toward another. Each of them also had two wings covering their bodies. Remember this. There's a flashing light that's constantly revealing the presence of God. In this, there's a vision of cherubim. In this, the cherubim are given an intelligent purpose. They've been given wheels to, yes, actually execute um, the judgment of God. This is what he's beginning to see. They're in exile, okay? And then when you get into verse 24, they moved, I heard the sound of their wings like the roar of mighty waters, like the voice of the Almighty, and a sound of commotion like the noise of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings, which just so you know, I love this voice. Like <laughs> when their wings moved, it was like the voice of God. It says in verse 25, a voice came from the expanse over their heads, which would be from the Lord. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. The shape of a throne with the appearance, <laughs> uh, the shape of a throne with the appearance of a sapphire stone was above the expanse. This is the presence of God. Above the four living creatures was the presence of God. There was a form with the appearance of a human on the throne high above. Okay, here you have uh, the appearance of a human on the throne. Maybe a picture of the Messiah himself. And as the voice spoke, they moved. And from verse 27, listen to this description, you guys. And just so you know, there's a description of this in Psalm 103. There's a description of Revelation 4. There's a picture, you guys, in Revelation 19 of this human on the throne. And look how they describe this human. From what seemed to be his waist up, he saw a gleam of like amber with what looked like fire enclosing it all around. From what seemed to be his waist down, I saw what looked like fire. There was a brilliant light all around him. And then what you see in verse 28 is kind of a cool picture. You can say, you can see <laughs> the glory of God was seen. The appearance of a brilliant light all around him was like of a rainbow in a cloud on rainy day. This was the appearance of the form of the Lord's glory. And when I saw it, I fell face down and I heard a voice speaking. So here's what you have, okay? You have a vision. I have to close with this, you guys. In Ezekiel, let's see if I can find this here. In Ezekiel 2, all I want to just say is, is it's, it's a summary of, and I like what uh, John MacArthur said. He said, chapter 1 is a divine appearance, and then in chapter 2 is a divine assignment. He sees the appearance of the glory of God in one, and then in two, there's a divine assignment, and he says to Ezekiel, the Holy Spirit, in verses 1 through 2, comes upon Ezekiel, okay? in preparation, and then it's in three through five, he gives him a call. He gives him a call. He gives him a call that he's gonna to go to this rebellious nations, and by the way, they're not gonna receive you, but I need you to understand, you've experienced the presence of God, now go do this. Ezekiel one and two, what we also call a fire hydrant. It's a fire hydrant of a whole lot of truth. Please, please, please slow down and read this for yourself. All right, we'll talk to you more tomorrow, thanks.